I was really overwhelmed with Global Brain. It's a, just a monumental piece of work. And I wanted to go through a number of themes from the book in some detail, and then kind of ask you to extrapolate because the book was written in 2000, and here we are in 2008, and we have this continuing hyper-acceleration of the interconnection of human minds through the internet, and so I wanted to kind of get your update, um, how you think things are playing out, but since most people probably won't have read the book, and there's just a ton of interesting stuff in there, I wanted to kind of go through the basic principles that you lay out and really the sort of theory of, in a way, it's a, it's a kind of a theory of, uh, of evolution as well as a theory of collective intelligence. Well, it really is. It's meant to be a, a theory of evolution. And, and what it has that um, Darwin doesn't have, although Darwin hints at, is first of all, um, the contemporary evolutionary theory is dominated by the notion of individual selection, and it's a very mathematically abstract idea of what human beings are all about or what animals are all about. Right, and you stress the notion of group selection, and, yes, and we should exactly. get into you know, exactly what you mean by that. It's quite fascinating. Well, one of the things that I'm working on right now, because I'm doing an update, updated edition of the Lucifer Principle, my first book, and these two fit together, is that um, the groups are learning machines. And that's true from the very beginning of life on up to today. Groups are parts of a global brain, and they were from the very beginning of life up until now. Um, and what do I mean by that? Um, bacterial colonies are, so far as we know, the first forms of life. And they appeared on this planet between 3.85 and 3.5 billion years ago. Now, that is so startlingly quick after the planet's formation that it's ridiculous. Um, that's less than a billion years after, or it's about 700,000 years, 700 million, I'm sorry, uh, after um, the, the planet formed, and all of a sudden life was there. But life was never, ever there as an individual process. It was never a matter of the selfish gene. It was never a matter of the individual out for his own benefit. Genome and not only that, but you, you point out that in its earliest forms, life had the advantage of not having cellular membranes and not having nuclei. So there was, a, I think the phrase that you use is global data sharing, which is a, which is a pretty evocative way to well, put it. Well, not just global data sharing. They were memory and computation engines from the very beginning. A genome is a team. It's not a group of selfish individuals, no matter what Richard Dawkins says. And by the way, Richard Dawkins' insights about the selfish gene and about uh, the meme are brilliant. Um, but... You, well, I, it was Darwin himself who said that uh, every, uh, every scientific explanation has to be clear about what it's for and what it's against, and it's often by standing against something that you define your ideas. Well, and I don't think you can think that the selfish gene is, is mutually exclusive to what you're talking about, right? No, not at all. Yeah, the selfish yeah. gene is very enlightening and, and should not be thrown away, nor should individual selection, nor should kin selection, the idea that because our genes are selfish, um, we work to save a brother more than we would work to save uh, a stranger because that brother carries our genes. And there's an arithmetic to individual selection that tells you uh, exactly what odds you should take on saving a brother uh, in order to save uh, a partial replica of your own genes and why saving a cousin is not worth as much to your selfish genes as saving a brother. And the, the uh, idea of individual selectionism also says it looks at a mystery of, that it calls altruism um, giving up yourself unselfishly unto others. And uh, it looks as an example at ant colonies in a uh, bee and wasp hive, well, primarily beehives. And in a beehive, you've got one reproductive individual who gets to reproduce her genes, period. And then you've got 20,000 other individuals who've entirely given up the privilege of reproduction. And what the, uh, the mathematicians of individual selection demonstrated quite brilliantly is that because... All of these, uh, all of the workers who've given up the privilege of procreation are daughters of the queen. She carries their genes. So by um, doing everything in the world that they can to give her enough food to make it through the winter and to reproduce many times over, um, to produce another 160,000 roughly bees a year, and even to generate entirely new hives that go flying off and finding their own locations to live, she is spreading if you are one of those sisters who've given up your ability to reproduce, John, 
that queen is spreading your genes on your behalf. Mm -hmm. And the arithmetic is brilliant. The problem is, and it's, it's terrific so far as it goes, the problem is it doesn't entirely work. Even doesn't even work in beehives because, uh, well, let's switch from beehives to Solenopsis ants. These are fire ants. Um, some fire ants are born with a gene that um, tells them that we will only accept one queen in the colony. Some of them are born with a gene that says, ah, oh, we'll accept more than one queen. And um, the, uh, if you have uh, a bunch of uh, the population of ants who have that gene that says, ah, let's get ourselves more than one queen, um, they begin to influence the other ants, and they will go out and kidnap an ant from another colony, a queen from another colony, and bring her in. Where does that fit in with the selfish gene? She carries an entirely different group of genes, or at least an entirely different group of genes according to the arithmetic of the individual and kin selectionists. And so in terms of group selectionism? Uh, in terms this? of individual selection, she carries, uh, there's an arithmetic. Yeah, but what's, the, what's the sort of group interpretation of that then? Well, the group interpretation, well, well let's just look at this for a second. They, they bring in this queen and she doesn't share the, the common genes and yet they rear her. Now, one problem with the arithmetic of the individual selectionists is they, they act as if a queen has a set of genes, and another queen in another colony has a very different set of genes. Well, in fact, um, the genes are 99.99% 99 .99 the same. Yeah, just like in people. Yeah, probably. they make ants. Yeah. Both those genes make ants. No matter which way you go, you're benefiting ants. Yep. Um, now, that's the, called species-level selection. When you look at a species, is out for its collective survival. But group survival is extremely important, because let's go back to the beginning of life. At the beginning of life, you had bacteria, um, bacterial colonies. A bacterial colony the size of my palm has 7 trillion members. Is that a loner? Is that a Clint Eastwood-like individual selection? Not, not by a long shot. Those 7 trillion members, that's more than all the human beings who've ever existed on one tiny bacterial colony, so thin that if it were on your palm, you couldn't see it. So what do you think accounts for this preference for individual selectionism, or to put it another way, the, the difficulty of seeing things in terms of a group-oriented selection mechanism? Uh, it's physics envy. Um, <laughs> until you can turn things into equations, you're not a real scientist. And even if you have to distort the truth dramatically in order to come up with equations, once you come up with equations, ah, you are a real scientist. You're part of the high priesthood of science. And that's a silly way to look at science, because science is about, the first two rules of science, as I learned them when I was 10 years old, are the truth at any price, including the price of your life, meaning if you're Galileo and you have an important truth, you don't give it up for anything. Now, that's, of course, Galileo did. He compromised. But fortunately, I wasn't told that when I was 10. <laughs> and look at things right under your nose as if you've never seen them before, and then proceed from there. Look at the ordinary things that everybody around you takes for granted.